Hello, I'm Dr Jane McCartney. I'm a chartered psychologist and I have a fascination for the criminal mind. In the Psychology of Crime videos, what I want to do is take you behind the headlines a little bit and kind of get into the mind of these criminals, these killers, just to give you an idea of what their thought processes may have been whilst they were committing the crime, but also perhaps afterwards as well, what they were thinking, what type of person were they? So in this video, I'm going to look at John Cooper, who is also known as the Pembrokeshire murderer, but also known as the game show Bullseye Killer. And I'll come on to that a little bit later as to why he was um, given that name. But before I start, if I could ask you please to like and subscribe and share and all those things that just helps the channel tremendously. The YouTube algorithm likes all that stuff, as I'm sure you well and truly know, and it just helps the channel. So thanks ever so much for doing that. So, John Cooper. In 1985, he would commit his first double murder of a brother and sister farm owning couple Richard and Helen Thompson. Now he would break in, he was a, a known petty criminal but also a violent, he was a violent man to, to his home, to his family, to people that knew him. He was particularly violent towards animals and I'll speak a little bit about that later on. But he was known to the police as a kind of a no good type person. They could never quite pin stuff on him and he was allowed to roam the area of Pembrokeshire in, in Wales in the UK and he seemingly broke in to the Thomas's farmhouse. Richard Thomas wasn't there, his sister was, Helen was there. He attacked her, she screamed and uh, Richard Thomas was on his way home. He heard his sister screaming, he ran into the farmhouse and he was confronted by Cooper who Julie shot him as well. He he previously shot Helen. He would take that shotgun that he had stolen from the, the Thomas farmhouse and he would use that in later atrocities that he would commit. But to cover his tracks, he would set fire to the farmhouse. And for a little while, the investigating officers just thought that's what it was. It was just a fire at the farmhouse. But when the autopsies were done on Richard and Helen, they found that they'd been shot. So they knew that they had a violent criminal in the area. Things went quiet for a couple of years. And then in 1989, a couple from Oxfordshire in the UK were on holiday in Pembrokeshire. It's a beautiful part of the country and attracts a lot of holiday makers. On their last day of their holiday, they were going for a walk along a beautiful coastal path and they had the misfortune to be encountered by Cooper, who, with the shotgun, would attack them, he would steal from them, he would assault the couple that he encountered that day, Peter and Gwenda Dixon. As I said, they were on the last day of their holiday, they were going for the last walk, and they had the misfortune to encounter Cooper. He would attack them, he would steal from them, he would assault Gwenda Dixon, and then he would kill them. And he covered their bodies in such a way that they weren't actually discovered for a few days. He knew what he was doing, and I'm going to talk about how he knew what he was doing a little bit later. Again, got away with this, and, and he would assault Gwenda Dixon, sexually assault Gwenda Dixon. He would hide the bodies, and then that was it. He kind of disappeared into the, the depths of the undergrowth in that area. There was one person that gave an artist's impression of Cooper. They saw somebody that they didn't know or thought that they were acting suspiciously, but they saw them kind of from behind, so they could only give an artist's impression of this person that they suspected was up to no good from behind. And that's an important point that we'll come back to again a little bit later on. Scroll forward, he's undertaking petty thievery, armed robbery, in 1996, Cooper, masked and armed with a sawn-off shotgun now, would attack a group of five teenagers, five local teenagers. He would steal from them, he would abuse them, he would take two of the girls off and sexually assault both of them and rape one of the others. At this point, the police knew that they were after 
one particular person. Before, they couldn't quite consolidate these crimes, but now they were beginning to think that they had an MO. But at this point, Cooper had been jailed previously for armed robbery, for burglary. And he was in jail. And although given a 16-year sentence, he was due for parole in about 2005. So Steve Wilkins knew that he had a bit of a race against time. He didn't have enough evidence. And this is where the artist's impression that I spoke about a, a little while ago came, came in because they were able to find him. They knew that Cooper had appeared in a, a, a UK game show, Bullseye, it's a, a game show about darts, and they knew that he'd appeared in the late 90s and they, tr they managed to go through all the archive with the help of the production company, with the help of the production company, and they were able to find him, and they got a date for when it was recorded, which was three weeks before the Dixon's brutal execution-type murder. And they had a shot of him from behind, like the artist impression, and these two things just went together. And as Wilkins, Detective Inspector Wilkins would say, as the police would say, it was so rare to get such an accurate match of a picture of Cooper from behind and the artist's impression behind. So they knew they had their man, but it wasn't quite enough. But on the strength of that, they were able to go and search his property. They would find a pair of shorts that he wore quite a lot. These turned out to be Gwenda Dixon's shorts that he'd stolen from her when he was potentially abusing her, because when she was found, she was found naked from the waist down. He had stolen these shorts. His wife, because they were too long for him, had turned them up. And in that alteration, captured enough DNA evidence. There was enough DNA evidence to put him at the crime of the murder of the Dixons, the murder of the Thomases, and also the rape and the assaults and the burglary of the teenagers. With this evidence, he was taken to court, and in 2011, he was convicted of a murder, these serial murders, and the assaults, and he was sentenced to prison and given a whole life tariff, meaning that he is not allowed to apply for parole because he's, he's considered to be a completely dangerous person. So let's have a think about what his thoughts and his behaviours and his beliefs may have been. Now, he is a person, he has been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, also known as being a psychopath. And psychopaths, narcissists, all the same kind of umbrella term. They have no regard, no thought for anybody. They um, they are the superior being. They have to dominate. Now, this is what makes a psychopath a psychopath. They have to dominate anybody in their situation. And if we go back to the murder of the Dixons on the coastal path, they would have likely, as all of us would in that situation, be pleading for their life. And at that point, his thoughts would have been, I am such a dominating, I am such a superior being to you. I can crush you. I will crush you. You are weak. I am so much better than you. And he would have got such a psychological and an egotistical boost from that. That's why it was such a brutal murder. The, the police described it as being like an execution. He was showing exactly what a dominating, what a superior, what a controlling, what a powerful character he was by undertaking these terrible crimes. And when the Dixons likely would have, of course, pleaded for their life, and who wouldn't in those situations, he would have just got such a thrill from that. He would have just thought, you're so weak. I am so superior to you. I'm so dominating of you. I enjoy this. And that's why there was just such a bloodlust in his killing of them. This was a middle-aged couple going out for a walk in the summer. You know, they were hardly equipped to be able to fight him off or reason with him that's all they had in their in their armory to be able to reason with him and he would have enjoyed that he would have enjoyed their last moments why because he is a psychopath and psychopaths enjoy this they enjoy the power they have they enjoy the control that they have now if we also think about his um escaping his his modus operandi if you like he would apparently cut holes in hedges so he could get through it was quite a farm um a rural area and he would 
he would know what he was doing because he was prepared for that. And apparently he would got um, an SAS survival book, which he, he loved. And I, there's an element of fantasy going on here. I don't know. I don't know. I can't find anything hardly about his background, whether he tried to join the military and been refused or just never had done. I just uh, I can't find anything out about him. But there's definitely a fantasy element of look at me, I'm escaping through hedgerows, I'm not going to get caught. Remember, I, I said that he would kind of slink away into the background after he'd committed his crimes, because he was ready for it. Apparently, when the Dixons were found, they weren't found for such a long time because he covered them in such a specific way. And again, this was all part of his fantasy, that he's, he's Rambo, basically, as far as he's concerned. He's getting away with these things because nobody's catching him. Nobody And nobody caught him for years, of course. And that just feeds into his impression of himself, his thoughts of himself as being this super intelligent, superior, dominating, clever, controlling person, which is all part of his psychopathy. So yeah, he would do that. And his thoughts as he's crawling through a hedgerow, uh, uh, and his thoughts as he's crawling through a hedgerow, getting away from yet another armed robbery would have been, look at me, nobody can touch me. I am literally Sylvester Stallone playing John Rambo. Nobody touched him. Nobody can touch me. So let's have a think about when he got caught. Apparently, he would blame a lot of this on his son. And again, this is another trait of a psychopath. They take no responsibility whatsoever for their actions, their behaviours, their thoughts. It's nothing to do with them. It's, it's the fault of the authorities for catching them it's the fault of somebody else for i don't know leaving evidence it's the fault of his wife potentially for sewing up these hems and leaving all the dna evidence it's never their fault they will never ever take responsibility for what they have done and that's an absolute classic tra trait of a psychopath somebody now there was an incident that he's not actually attributed to, as in he's, he's not been held accountable to in a court of law, but they very much think that he was involved in the death of an elderly local woman, Flo Evans. And apparently he, he would go round to her house. She knew him, he knew her. I don't know if he was going round there as an odd job man. I'm not too sure. But he would certainly know how to gain entry into this lady's house. He also knew where her valuables were. Now, she was found dead in her bath, in a cold bath, and they knew it was a cold bath because apparently it was a pretty rural little cottage that she lived in. And to, to be able to have a warm bath, she used to have to heat the water on a stove. And they, had, they were able to ascertain that there'd been no heating of any water for quite some time before she was found. And she was found fully clothed in this cold bath, dead. Again, his thoughts to that were, you're letting me in, you know me. I, I can rationalise this. I need money. He had a gambling habit as well, of course. Um, I need money. I know where there is money. I rationalise that. You you have me round at your house. You must know what I'm like. You've heard the rumours about me and my violent conduct, and yet you're letting me into your house. So I rationalise that. I rationalise exactly the crimes that I'm going to commit against you. And what am I going to do with you? You're easily dismissed. I'm just going to put you in the bath. I'm clever like that because they won't be able to find any evidence. And apparently one of the other things that he learned from his book was to take Pepper with him. And if there were ever um, any guard dogs or, 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 or something that could get some kind of smell from him, he would then use Pepper to, 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 to put them off the scent. So again, here's a person that thinks he's so above the law, so above evidence, so above DNA, so above being able to be found out. And for years... This was true. Nobody caught him. They, Of course, they had that idea that it was him, but nobody caught him because apparently this armed robbery spree when he was in prison the first time, this spree was going down. So they were very much attributing it to him. His thoughts when he was potentially killing Flo Evans was, you deserve this. I can rationalise this to myself. The same when he was burglaring anywhere and being an armed robber anywhere he was rationalizing it to himself i need the money i have a gambling habit i have a family i whatever i need a new car it doesn't matter he would be rationalizing it himself and normal rules of course don't apply to the likes of cooper so the normal rules of don't burgle don't murder don't harm 
don't, whatever it is, don't apply to him. He's above that. All psychopaths, of course, think that they are above the law and norma, you know, and normality and rules and constraints. They don't apply to the likes of Cooper as far as he's concerned. And of course, all psychopaths think that they're unique. They think that they're the only one. That's why they're always loners. Now, the last thing I just wanted to say about potentially what his thoughts were was when he was in court. And again, he was very dismissive. He'd been brought to court. When he was given his sentence, apparently he was screaming, he was shouting at the judge, he was being abusive, he was being dismissive, because that's his thoughts. His, his thoughts would have been, I am not held accountable to anybody. The only law that I am accountable to is myself. I'm not accountable to you. I'm not accountable to the police, to the courts, to society, to whoever. I am not accountable because I am my own lawmaker. I am the one that makes the rules. I am the one that breaks the rules. And he just couldn't accept that and this is really typical of a lot of killers a lot of criminals they are abusive they're nasty they shout threats as they're being hauled down to start their going to be in to start their going to be in prison forever sentence they are completely dismissive and abusive a lot of killers will not come to court as a last gesture almost of I'm not accountable, I don't recognise you, so I'm not even going to enter the court, which in the UK they they have the right to do. It's cowardice, of course, because they're not going to stand there and take the punishment or accept the punishment or acknowledge the punishment. If they're not even there, then in their head, they're not accepting it. And of course, everybody is wrong. The police that investigated, the jury that found him guilty, the judge that has given the sentence, the useless defence counsel that he had, the prosecutors, everybody is in the wrong boat. So there's always threats of revenge, there's always threats of retaliation, and there's always threats of non-compliance. And that's all that the likes of Cooper have at the end. They have no power, they have no say in where they go, how they're treated, they have nothing left. But they will literally go down kicking and screaming because that is their personality. So that is the psychopathy, the thoughts, the behaviours of John Cooper, also known as the Pembrokeshire murderer, the bullseye serial killer or the game show killer. If I could ask you to please like, subscribe, um, share and ring the bell, notification bell if you like what you, you see. And I'll be back again with another Psychology of Crime video in the near future. And until then, thanks ever so much for watching and goodbye.